These are the answers to the chapter 5 and 6 practice quiz. Starting with the multiple choice questions, number 1. So in this problem, we have 50 grams of warm water at 40 degrees Celsius, and we're mixing it with 30 grams of water at 20 degrees Celsius. The final temperature of this mixture is going to be somewhere in between 20 and 40 degrees Celsius. To figure this out, we have to consider that the heat lost by the warm water is equal to the heat gained by the cool water. So we're going to use the equation Q equals MC delta T, and the heat lost by the warm water is going to equal its mass, so 50 grams, times the specific heat of water, times the delta T, which is 40 minus X. The delta T for the cool water is going to be X minus 20, and there was 30 grams of cool water. We can cross off the specific heat of water on both sides. We can do a little bit of algebra, and we get 2,000 minus 50x equals 30x minus 600. And then we get 2,600 equals 80x. So x is equal to the final temperature of the water, which is 2600 divided by 80, or 260 over 8, or 130 over 4. And you can see that the answer is going to be approximately 33 degrees Celsius. Number two is talking about a sample of metal that was transferred to room temperature water around 22 degrees Celsius. So the metal was at 100 degrees Celsius, and the final temperature of both the water and the metal was 35 degrees Celsius. So the water has warmed up by around 13 degrees, and the metal has cooled down by around 65 degrees. Now even though the metal temperature changed more than the water temperature did, what's constant here, what's going to be obeying the first law of thermodynamics, or the law of conservation of energy, is the amount of heat lost by the metal is equal to the amount of heat gained by the water. So the reason why D could not be true is that they're going to have different specific heat values and in general the larger the delta T the smaller the specific heat capacity is. So we can eliminate choices C and D and again we're obeying the law of conservation of energy. In number three it's talking about the amount of heat associated with a certain quantity of chlorine, so 0.1 mole of chlorine gas, being produced. Now it says chlorine is formed from KCl. That means that the reaction that is shown to us needs to be reversed in order for chlorine to be produced. When we flip a chemical equation around, we change the sign of delta H. So now that we know this, Let's consider that if we had doubled the equation coefficients, that would give us one mole of chlorine instead of a half a mole of chlorine. Of course, doubling the coefficients means that you also double the value of delta H. So if one mole of chlorine is associated with 880 kilojoules of heat, and again, being absorbed because delta H is now positive, that means that 0.1 mole of chlorine being formed would involve 88 kilojoules of heat being absorbed. So correct answer is D. In number four, we have a reaction between sodium peroxide, which is Na2O2. It has a molar mass of 78 grams per mole. We have sulfur, which has a molar mass of 32 grams per mole, and we have excess water. So based on this information, we have 7.8 grams of sodium peroxide, which is 0.1 mole. We have 3.2 grams of sulfur, which is also 0.1 mole. But we have a 2 to 1 mole ratio in the balanced chemical equation. So for every 1 mole of sodium peroxide that reacts, 
that would be a half a mole of sulfur reacting with it. If we have 0.1 moles of sodium peroxide, that can react with 0.05 moles of sulfur. But in order for all of the sulfur to react, we would need twice as much, or 0.2 moles of sodium peroxide. And since that amount of sodium peroxide is not available, that means that sodium peroxide, or Na2O2, is the limiting reactant, and sulfur is the excess reactant. Now we know that our answer is either A or B. With respect to the heat involved, considering the fact that two moles of sodium peroxide are listed in the equation, and that would release 600 kilojoules of heat, one mole of sodium peroxide would release 300 kilojoules of heat. 0 0.1 mole of sodium peroxide would release 30 kilojoules. So the correct answer is A. Number five is referring to an equation that allows you to calculate the delta H for a reaction from the enthalpy of formation. So the enthalpy of formation for the products minus the enthalpy of formation for the reactants. And again, this is the sum of all of the products and all of the reactants. You don't see the enthalpy of formation for oxygen gas or nitrogen gas because those are elements. And that is the natural state in which those elements occur. So therefore, the enthalpy of formation would be defined as zero for those two elements. So if we do products minus reactants, we have 2 times 0 plus 6 times the value for water minus 4 times the value for ammonia, NH3, and then plus 3 times 0. This math is equal to negative 1,440 minus negative 200. So the correct answer is B, negative 1240. Number six is a problem that involves Hess's law. So our target equation is the sublimation of iodine, in which iodine goes from a solid to a gas. Our first equation has one half a mole of solid iodine on the left. We would like there to be one mole of iodine, so we're going to double the first equation. And when we double that equation, the delta H becomes 52 kilojoules. Our second equation needs to be reversed and doubled so we can get one mole of iodine gas on the right. So therefore, the delta H now becomes positive, but not positive 5. It becomes positive 10 because we're doubling it. If we add these two equations together, we can cross off hydrogen and hydrogen iodide. And the delta H is the sum of 52 and 10. So the correct answer is D, 62 kilojoules per mole. Number seven is also an example where the delta H for a reaction is equal to the sum of the enthalpy of formation of the products minus that of the reactants. In this case, we know the delta H for the overall combustion of methane. So it's negative 890. And that is going to equal products minus reactants. So the products would be X plus 2Y in terms of carbon dioxide and water. The reactants would be the enthalpy of formation for methane plus 2 times 0 since we have molecular oxygen. So when we do this math to solve for the enthalpy of formation for methane, we're going to get x plus 2y plus 890. So the correct answer is A. In number 8, it's a Hess's law problem. The target equation is that we need one mole of sodium oxide on the left. We need one mole of liquid water on the left and two moles of sodium hydroxide on the right. So the first two equations have to be reversed because of the water and the sodium oxide. So the delta H for those reactions will be negative A and negative B. 
The third equation just needs to be doubled, so the delta H for that equation is going to be 2C. When we add the equations together, we can cancel out the sodium, we can cancel out the oxygen and the hydrogen, and our value of delta H overall is going to equal 2C minus A minus B, so the correct answer is D. In number nine, we have a form of electromagnetic radiation, which is labeled Y. It has a lower frequency than X, so therefore it should have a longer wavelength and a lower energy. So a longer wavelength than 10 to the minus 13 meters would be 10 to the minus six meters, and a lower energy would be two times 10 to the negative 19 joules. So correct answer for number nine is D. Number 10 is simply referring to the photoelectric effect. We've got to find which statement is most closely associated with that phenomenon. And if you look on page 211 in your book, it says that light shining on a clean metal surface causes the surface to emit electrons. So therefore, the correct answer to number 10 is A. Number 11 is asking us to find a pair of electron configurations that represent the ground state and the excited state for the same element. The problem with choice A is that there is no such thing as a 2D orbital. And the problem with choice D is that you cannot put three electrons into a S orbital. So 3S3 is not allowed. So now we're down to B and C. The problem with choice C is that if I have a total of nine electrons, so 1s2, 2s2, 2p5, that would be fluorine, for example. I can't then go to 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, that would be neon. That's an extra electron, so it's not the same element. So I'm telling you that the correct answer is B. Let's understand what exactly does an excited state mean. Well, here is the ground state configuration for neon. So 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. An excited state might take an electron from a lower energy level and have it jump up to a higher level. So we still have 10 total electrons, but the diagram on the right would show you what an excited state would look like. Again, correct answer is B. Number 12, we have to consider the eight elements in period three. So we'll start with sodium, and go all the way to argon. Sodium's electron configuration has one unpaired electron. Magnesium's electron configuration has zero unpaired electrons. And then we come to aluminum, which has one unpaired electron. Silicon, as you can see, has two unpaired electrons. And then after silicon is phosphorus, which would have three unpaired electrons. After phosphorus is sulfur, which as you can see also has two unpaired electrons. And after sulfur is chlorine, which has one unpaired electron. And finally, argon has zero unpaired electrons. So the correct answer is two elements, namely silicon and sulfur. Number 13 is talking about the electron configuration for not cobalt, the atom, but cobalt, the ion, which carries a two plus charge. So the electron configuration for cobalt, which is atomic number 27, is argon, 3d7, 4s2. But when we take away two electrons from an atom of cobalt, the question might be, which orbital loses two electrons? Is it the 3d7 that now becomes 3d5? Or is the 4s2 going to lose two electrons? Remember, the instructions are to remove the electrons from the orbital that has the largest or highest principal quantum number. So comparing 3d 
with 4s, the orbital that has the highest value of n is 4s. So because those electrons are removed first, the correct answer would be argon 3d7. That is what the electron configuration for the cobalt 2 plus ion looks like. All right, moving on to question 14. We have successive ionizations for a particular element. The first electron is removed, and that requires 740 kilojoules per mole. The second electron is removed and requires 1450, but then as you can see, there's a rather large increase when you get to the third ionization event, over 7,000 kilojoules per mole. So we're trying to figure out why there would be such a large difference between the second and the third ionization energies. I'm going to direct you to a part of the book that we haven't read yet. We haven't talked about chapter 7, but this is table 7.2 and it does a nice job of explaining what's going on. You already know that different energy levels have different shells, so level 1, level 2, level 3, and so forth. And what this is talking about is successive ionization energies for various elements. And they're highlighting the blue section of this table and referring to them as the inner shell electrons. The first electron to be removed from sodium comes from an outer shell electron, but that's it. Sodium only has one outer shell electron. Look at that big jump between 496 and 4562. Magnesium experiences a rather large increase between the second and the third. That's just like our question. Aluminum has a large increase in ionization energy between the third and the fourth. So what's going on here? Well, every element experiences a large increase in ionization energy when one of its inner electrons is removed. So therefore, if we see a rather large increase in the ionization energy value, we can assume that there must be a reason for why that electron is so difficult to remove compared to the others. So what's going on? That huge increase in ionization energy must be the result of an inner shell electron being removed. This particular element, element X, probably only has two valence electrons. And since it only has two valence electrons that are located in the outer shell, that next electron to be removed is coming from an inner shell, which is much closer to the nucleus. So the correct answer is that the electron removed during the third ionization is, on average, much closer to the nucleus, and that's why it was so much more difficult for that electron to be removed. All right, now moving on to our next multiple choice question. Here we have the PES diagram, the photoelectron spectrum for beryllium. Peak A is referring to the 1s orbital because it has a higher binding energy. Peak B is referring to the 2s orbital because it has a lower binding energy. So again, the electrons in the 1s orbital are closer to the nucleus and require more energy to remove. And the electrons that are located in the 2s orbital are farther away from the nucleus and require less energy to remove. So based on this information, the correct answer concerning this diagram would be C, the electrons in peak A require more energy to remove because they are closer to the nucleus. That's 1s versus 2s. All right, so now we're on to the free response questions. Number one is giving us a structural formula of phenol. So we'll start by writing that particular molecular formula as C6H6O. If we're going to do a combustion equation, we need oxygen as a reactant, and we're going to produce both carbon dioxide and water. And you didn't have to write the phases of matter for this particular question. So all we have left to do is balance the equation. We need six carbons on the right. We need six hydrogens on the right. And we need a total of 
12 plus 3, so 15 oxygens on the left. So now the equation is balanced with coefficients of 1, 7, 6, and 3. In part B of this question, it says that 2 grams of pure solid phenol is burned completely and that the temperature of the calorimeter went from 25.00 to 33.62 degrees Celsius. The heat capacity of the calorimeter is 7.54 kilojoules per degree Celsius. So the amount of heat released to the calorimeter is 7.54 kilojoules per degree Celsius times the delta T. So the delta T is 8.62 degrees Celsius and our answer rounded off to three significant figures is 65.0 kilojoules. Notice that there was not grams involved in this calculation. That's because the heat capacity of the calorimeter only has units of kilojoules per degree Celsius. So what are we going to do with this 65.0 kilojoules? Well, let's see what the next question is talking about. Calculate the enthalpy change in units of kilojoules per mole of reaction. So we haven't calculated moles yet. Here's our equation involving phenol, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and water. We know that we had 65 kilojoules, but we have to figure out the kilojoules per mole of reaction. So where do we get moles from? Well, they gave us two grams of phenol that was burned. Let's convert that from grams to moles using the periodic table. The molar mass of phenol works out to be 94.108 grams. Rounded off to three significant figures, we have 0 0.0213 moles of phenol. So 65 kilojoules divided by 0 0.0213 moles, that will give us our answer in units of kilojoules per mole of reaction. So because we have one mole of phenol in our balanced chemical equation, then we can do this calculation based on moles of phenol. So we end up with a number on our calculator that's rounded off to three significant figures, 3,050. Now if you had used the unrounded answer for moles in your calculator, you might have gotten perhaps 3,060 or something like that, but this is okay. The only thing that's missing from this final answer is that it was an exothermic combustion equation. So your final answer needs to have the appropriate sign for an exothermic reaction. So correct answer is negative 3,050 kilojoules per mole. In part C, we're going to take our answer from the part B Roman numeral 2 and we're going to do the calculation of the enthalpy of formation for phenol, which we don't know. We know the value for carbon dioxide. We know the value for liquid water, and we can assume that this was liquid water in this problem. And we don't know the value for oxygen, although I guess we do because it's defined as zero for an element. So let's solve for the enthalpy of formation for phenol by setting up the equation. Negative 3050 is equal to six times the number for CO2 plus three times the number for water minus the reactants, which is the phenol and zero for oxygen. So the math that we're doing on our calculator would be negative 3218.4 plus 3050 and that's going to equal the enthalpy of formation for phenol, and it works out to be negative 168 kilojoules per mole. I just rounded off to the nearest whole number because I was limited by negative 3050. All right, so that is our answer for part C. Now we're on to number two, which is a chapter six type of question. A certain light produces a um, yellow color of light, which has a wavelength of 580 nanometers. We're going to use the equation that relates wavelength and frequency. We're going to convert the wavelength into meters. So 580 nanometers is equal to 5.8 times 10 to the negative 7 meters. The speed of light 
divided by the wavelength equals the frequency and would have units of hertz or inverse seconds. So when we do that math, we get a frequency of 5.2 times 10 to the 14th hertz. All right, on to part B. We're going to calculate the energy. So we're going to use the equation involving Planck's constant. Multiplying Planck's constant times the frequency gives us a value of 3.4 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. And that would be joules for a single photon. In part C, we have to decide if this particular form of light would be enough to break the bond in bromine molecules. Let's convert our answer, which is in joules, into kilojoules per mole. So first we're going to go from joules per photon to kilojoules per photon. And then using Avogadro's number, we now have kilojoules per mole. So the value we get from this calculation is around 200 kilojoules per mole. So is this light sufficient to break the BR-BR bond? And the answer is yes. It does have sufficient energy to break the bond because 205 kilojoules per mole is greater than 192, which is the minimum amount required. In part D, we're talking about not yellow light, which is visible light, but rather infrared light. Infrared light is going to be longer wavelength, lower frequency, and lower energy as compared to visible light. So therefore, it is likely that infrared radiation does not have enough energy to break the bond in bromine molecules. All right, our next free response question involves this unknown element, which has the PES diagram, photoelectron spectroscopy. The first peak, the one that has the highest binding energy, should be 1s. This is 1s2. The next peak is 2s2. The third peak is going to be 2p6. The next peak would be 3s2. And then finally, 3p one because it is only half as much in terms of the peak height which is the number of electrons so what element has 1s2 2s2 2p6 3s2 3p1 that would be 13 electrons atomic number 13 is aluminum we have now identified the element we know it's aluminum and we know the peaks in order from left to right are 1s 2s, 2p, 3s, and then finally 3p on the diagram. Explain why peak D is twice as high as peak E. Well, the answer is that the vertical axis of a PES diagram, which is referring to the relative number of electrons, peak D is twice as high as peak E because the 3s orbital for aluminum contains two electrons, whereas the 3p orbital for aluminum only contains one electron. And then finally, explain why peak C is higher as a binding energy than peak D, and this has to do with the distance to the nucleus. So the electrons in a 2p orbital are closer to the nucleus and harder to remove. They experience a greater attraction toward the nucleus than the electrons in the 3s orbital. So when you're changing from level 2, or principal quantum number, n equals 2, to n equals 3, that means that you are going higher in energy. So the lower energy level is going to be closer to the nucleus and experience a higher binding energy. All right, well, that wraps up the explanations for the Chapter 5 and 6 practice quiz. Good luck studying for your quiz. I hope that those answers were helpful.